appreciate it. It's a basketball team that has a record like a lacrosse team. Which means not a lot of wins. I really appreciate that. I, I hate introductions, but I appreciate that that introduction. I got shell-shocked at an introduction in 1991 and I'm still not over it. So right after college, I was signed to a record label called Delicious Vinyl, out of Cap not far from here actually. And Delicious Vinyl had two big acts at the time. One was a guy named Tone Loke. You guys, some of you guys look like of age. He had Wild Thing and Funky <laughs> Cold Medina. And the other was a guy who won a Grammy for his song called Bust a Move you guys might know. I was the next artist signed to this record company called Delicious Vinyl. And before my album even came out, I got a call one day from the owner of the record company who told me they're having this concert in Atlanta, Georgia at the Georgia Dome. I live in Atlanta. And they were busing in 38,000 inner city kids from all over the state of Georgia to the Georgia Dome for this concert that they were calling the Increase the Peace concert because they were going to have black artists and white artists come together in this like community bonding event that they were calling Increase the Peace. But the day before the event, Vanilla Ice canceled and they needed a white rapper. So they volunteered me to be the white act at the event. So I get a plane ticket, I fly down to the Georgia Dome, and as soon as I get there, I recognize immediately like the crowd is unruly. Like, the, I mean, there's fist fights going on in the crowd and they're putting the house lights on to control everybody. There's police everywhere and the kids are booing every single act that comes on stage, they're booing him off the stage. So the first guy up was LL Cool J in his prime, and they booed LL Cool J off the stage. <laughs> oh, okay. All right, that's fine. So I'm, I'm literally, they're watching this happen. I'm sitting over here in the green room about to go on next to sing my song called Shake It Like a White Girl. <laughs> so I call my mother. I call my mom. Like, I'm 21 years old. I said, Mom, I have a really big problem, man. They're booing LL off the stage. I'm up next. And my mother said, sweetie, just be yourself. They're going to love you. <laughs> That's not the way it works. So the MC gets up. He's like, ladies and gentlemen, all the way from California, IA, give it up for my main man, Jesse James, which was my, my stage name, but definitely don't Google it, please. <laughs> So I'm sitting over here, I'm about to go on stage, and as I come out, I can see the kids looking at me, and they are, like, pissed that I'm even coming on stage. And I had some t-shirts that the record company gave me, so I, I came on stage, and I'm like, there's a section over here, want some free t-shirts? And the kids go nuts, so I threw them out. I'm like, you guys want some free t-shirts back here? They went crazy, I threw them out. I'm like, middle section, you guys want some t-shirts? They went nuts. I threw them, I said, thank you guys very much, salt and pepper's up next, and I got the fuck out of there. <laughs> It was like my first lesson in business, don't let them boo you. <laughs> so I'm still not over that, so the introduction still freaks me out. Before we even get started, I just wanted to point out one thing about what Roland said about just now. First of all, I want to make a million dollars a day. I'm coming to the course. Um, about just businesses that require fewer customers versus more customers. It just it hit a nerve with me because I always tell people, you know, I'm, I'm turning 50 and I've had a business that generated a ton of money, it was a high ticket item. We sold airplanes for $250,000, basically 25 hour clips. And that business, we said to ourselves, all right, if we get 4,000 people, if we can get 4,000 customers, we're doing a billion dollars a year. And I'm like, we're getting 4,000 customers. Let's hire more salespeople. Let's, we know who the people are that can afford it. Let's go get them. And that was like our goal. We had the number 4,000 written down and, and we did it. But it was, we only had to get 4,000 people, 7 billion people in the world. We had to get 4,000. We can do that. When we had Zico coconut water, we had to sell 50,000 $2 bottles a week. And if you didn't buy it next week, we had to find someone to replace you and identify new customers. That's really hard. I love businesses that require a small amount of people that will pay more. Get me, five, get me 500 people that will pay 20, 20 to 50 thousand dollars, you know, as opposed to going to get. So that really hit a nerve with me, and that's something. As we enter this chapter of our life, I'm a big believer in these two, these two kind of columns. One is high aggravation versus low aggravation. So aggravation over here, reward over here. You want to do stuff in your life 
that is super as low aggravate as low on the aggravation meter as possible with the most reward. For me, if it's mega high aggravation and mega reward, I'm not doing it. It's just not worth it at this stage for any of us. We want to work on things however we approach, however hard they look, that are low aggravation or we make them low aggravation. We hire people to do things that you don't want to do, to take the aggravation off your plate to get the most reward. So it just that resonated with me and that's just something that, that, that I really believe in. I want to give you guys 20 minutes on my journey as an entrepreneur. It was very unconventional to say the least. As you guys just heard, that was the start of my career. And there might be some nuggets for you guys uh, in, in your journey as entrepreneurs, as business men and women. And then 20 minutes with, uh, of my story living with a Navy SEAL that I hired to live with me. A guy coined the toughest man on the planet for a reason. And the life lessons that I learned from him and how I apply those lessons to all the buckets of my life. So a little bit about me real quick. Um, I went to American University in Washington, D.C. Anybody? <laughs> I don't think there's ever been anybody. Never, <laughs> there never is. I went, but anyway, the tuition at American University today is $40,000 a year. So for $160,000 of what my parents would have paid today to send me to American University, I honestly remember one thing. I call it the $160,000 lesson. So my senior year, I was taking an advertising class and I was at a crossroads in my life. I was either going to go into the music business, I love music, or I was going to sell a product called Aunt Franny's Brownies. So I had a roommate in college who had an Aunt Franny and every month she sent us like a shipment of brownies and I, mean, I don't know what she put in these brownies, but they made me happy. <laughs> like, I can sell these brownies. So for, the, for my advertising class senior year, we had to create for our final exam a fictitious brand from scratch. Marketing campaign, jingle, which I was good at, slogan, mission statement, packaging, everything, soup to nuts. And I'm like, I'm gonna use this class as my R&D department. I'll use Aunt Franny's brownies and if the professor likes it, if I get a good grade, I'm going into the brownie business. So I go, so for the final exam, the way it was structured was there were a class of about 100 people, it was very similar to this size room, about 100 people, maybe a little bit bigger. And the professor said, everybody has to prepare their campaign and hand it in, except I'm going to pick five people that will present orally a 30 minute presentation on the state of the union of the industry you're going in and how your brand or new product would fit in to the marketplace. It's like, I'm a senior in college, there's 100 people in the class, he's picking five, 5% 5 chance, like nobody prepared to do the oral presentation. So we go into the class and the professor says, I'm gonna do this the democratic way. Everybody write down your name, put it in a hat, and I'll pick out the five names of the people that are gonna present. Sitting to my right in the class was a guy named Ronnie Cohn. Ronnie Cohn was a professional jackass. Ronnie Cohn bullied me and all these other kids for four years of college. So I took 20 pieces of paper and I wrote Ronnie Cohn's name down. I stuffed them into the hat when the professor took the hat around. Jackass. <laughs> sure enough, the, so the professor you know, gets all the names and comes and picks out the first name and pulls it out of a hat. This is a true story. And sure enough, the first name that comes up, Jesse Itzler, the jackass, did the same thing. <laughs> So I get up there and I start pitching this Aunt Franny's brownies. I'm unprepared. And the 30 seconds in, the professor says, stop, Southern guy. I don't remember his name. He says, stop, for $160,000. He says, son, I want to know what is your point of differentiation? I'm like, I'm a brownie. I'm home baked. I could be gluten free if you want me to be gluten free. I'm moist. I'm delicious. He says, no. There's a thousand brownies out in this world. Substitute them for real estate investor, for banker, for advertiser, for lawyer. If you want to do something and be successful in this world, you have to stand out. You have to do it a little bit differently. You have to be a much different brownie. Then sit down. So I sat down in my chair, embarrassed, in front of the whole class. And I'm like, I thought to myself, literally on the spot, I'm like, I have a point of differentiation. It's 1999. I'm a white rapper. It's only me and Vanilla Ice. Like, that's my point of differentiation. <laughs> I'm going in the music business. So at that time, the only, I had no connections. I, had, I, had, I didn't have a lawyer. I'd never been in a studio. I don't play an instrument. I'm not a great singer. Like, not a great storyline to become, to get into the music business. In fact, the only way that I could make a demo 
was to take an instrumental, the music part of a song, and put it into my cassette player, walk over to my answering machine while the music was playing, and hit record, and leave a rap message on my answering machine. <laughs> That was my demo. That was my demo. And I took that demo and I sent it to every record label on the planet. And of course I got no responses. So I rejigged my schedule in college. So every Friday I would take the train or I would drive or I would get on a plane if I could afford it, maybe once the semester. And I would fly to New York and uh, uh, go to record labels and I would literally hand out my cassette. I would sit in the waiting room and I would hand out to anyone that came out I had a little thing that I wrote with my name and my contact to anyone, and nobody called me. And I'm like, how does this happen? So I started promoting my answering machine and having people call my answering machine. I would change my raps every day. <coughs> and all my other friends were making resumes, and I'm like, no, this is, my, this is what I want to do. This is, what, this is my goal. And one day a producer called my machine, and he said, I think there's something here, but man, we got to professionalize this. He said, I just got a job in New York City working as a at a studio, as an engineer, and nobody comes to the studio at two after 2 a.m. That's the last session. If you could come up to New York, come into the studio at 2 o'clock, I'll get you in to record. So I moved to New York right after college, and I got a job as a kiddie pool attendant, literally, because that was the only job where I could ride my bike 20 miles every night at 2 in the morning, from, Lo from Roslyn, Long Island, where I live, to Corona, Queens, going to the studio and get back in time on my bike after the session to get to the kiddie pool to make money. I had to make money. So uh, one day I'm riding my bike on the LIE. Anyone from New York here? One? Okay. On the LIE. You might know the LIE. There are no bikes on the LIE. If you ever saw a guy riding a bike on the LIE, it was me. I'm riding to the studio. It's 2 o'clock. I show up at the studio. And on the mix board, is a cassette. And it's the cassette that completely changed my life. So the cassette was by an artist named Dana Dane. And it doesn't matter if you know him, Dana was a, a rapper in the 80s, from a big rapper from Brooklyn, who was one of my favorite artists. He had just recorded in the, in the studio, and he left an advanced cassette of his second album right on the mix board. So I asked the engineer if I could borrow the cassette, and I'd bring it back, no harm, no foul, no one would know, and listen to it. He said, sure. So I take the cassette, I'm flying out to LA to visit a friend two days later, I'm listening to it on my Sony Walkman, if you guys remember, not to date myself, and as I'm, I'm on the plane, I'm reading it, the owner of Delicious Vinyl Records, Tone Loke, Young MC, the biggest independent label at the time, his favorite artist is Dana Dane. So when I land, I cold call the label, and that's a big theme in my life. If I want to get on someone's radar, if I want to get to someone, I pick up the phone and I call them. So I call the record company and I get all the way up to Mike Ross, the owner's assistant. All the way up to his assistant and I said, uh, I'm a friend with Dana, I have a cassette that Dana wants Mike to hear the cassette. She puts me on, there's an old saying by Harry Truman, if you can't convince them, confuse them. <laughs> she has no idea what I'm talking about. She comes back a minute later and she says, Dana, Mike is so excited to meet you. If you could be here at 2 o'clock, Mike can have some lunch with you. I'm like, Dana will be there at 2 o'clock. Dana's a black guy from Brooklyn with gold teeth. <laughs> I'm not. So I show up at 2 o'clock. I buzz in. I said, hey, it's Dana for Mike. I said, oh, Dana, come on in. Mike is expecting you. And they sit me down in Mike's office. And I'm looking at the gold record from Young and the gold record, Wild Thing, and Funky Cold Medina. And I'm sitting in the chair. I'm like, I have no agenda, I, don't even, I just got to get a record deal, man. I've got all this rejection, and in comes Mike Ross into the office. And he looks at me, and he says, who the fuck are you? <laughs> and I said, I'm Jesse, I, like, I work with Dana. He goes, you work with Dana? What do you do? I said, I rap. And he starts hysterically laughing. He calls his assistant, he thought Ashton Kutcher was punking him. <laughs> I'm dead serious. I said, no, I really do, I really do. I said, can I play my cassette while we wait for Dana? <clears throat> He says, sure. So I put my cassette in on the song called College Girls. I play this cassette for 30 seconds. He says, stop. And he says the four words that every struggling artist wants to hear. Who is your lawyer? I got a record deal. But I didn't have a, I didn't have a lawyer. I had a dad. And my dad owned a plumbing supply house in Mineola. <laughs> so I said, my dad's my lawyer. He said, your dad's your lawyer? I said, yes, he is. He said, OK, I'll arrange everything with your dad. So I leave the office and I call my dad. I go, dad. 20 years old. Man, I got a record deal. You suck. Like, I got a record deal. 
You know, I know my dad's from Brooklyn. I know my dad can screw everything up because he could be like, you know, you take advantage of my son. I'll fly out to California. Fuck. I said, Dad, all I want you to do when they call up, the only thing I want you to say is this. I said, please fax all the documents to my assistant. My father says, I don't have an assistant. I go, yes, you do. Mom. <laughs> so they faxed all these stack of documents to my mother and I signed them. And that's how I got a record deal. And then I made the biggest mistake of my life at the time. My only goal was to get a record deal. That was it. And I didn't reset my goal. I wasn't like, oh, I want to have a 10 year career, sell 5 million records, put money in my pocket, invest it well and retire. All I cared about was getting a record deal. It's very important to reset your goals every year and to actually write them down. There's all kinds of studies. There's a famous Harvard study on the importance of writing down. They, they actually interviewed um, like 100 Harvard MBAs or something and then they went back 10 years later after they graduated and asked the graduating class, I don't know if you guys are familiar with this study, they asked the graduating class who had written down their goals who had goals when they graduated and who just thought them. And the group that actually wrote down their goals they like, it was like 40x what everybody else. I mean, an amazing amount of success versus those that just thought it. But I didn't do any of that. So of course, I didn't get picked up for a second album. So I moved back to New York with two things on my resume. Kitty pool attendant, rapper. <laughs> it's not, that's not gonna get you a seat here with Roland and Perry and the guys. So, so I moved back to New York and my wife always says, that you find your purpose. The pur your purpose is the intersection of what you're good at, what you like to do, and what's good for the world. If you can figure out what you like to do, what you're good at, and do something that actually has a positive impact in the world, that's your purpose. Well, I love sports. I love music. I wasn't sure if I was good at either, but I wanted to marry that, those two properties. So I came up with an idea to write a theme song for the New York Knicks, 1990. Two. The Knicks paid me $4,000 for the song. By the time I paid the studio, the engineer, the lawyer that I now had, the singer, the producer, it cost me $4,800 to do the song. But the song, the Knicks got hot, the song became the number one most requested song on New York radio. And every team that came into Madison Square Garden to play the Knicks were like, why don't we have a song like this? And I'm like, that's my brownie. That's my brownie, man. Everybody else is trying to do music. Put them in the stores. There's 100 professional sports teams. $4,000 a song. I'm a pretty good salesman. I could sell the majority of these teams. There's efficiencies. I'll get my cost down. That's a great point of differentiation. Nobody's doing it. So I literally created a new category in music called sports music and started signing up teams. And I sold that company to a public company called SFX. The owner of SFX had a timeshare on a private jet. And he invited my, pr my partner and I as guests on his plane to go on a trip. And it was like, when we walked in, it was like the scene in, in The Wizard of Oz when everything goes from black and white to color. I'm like, people fly like this? I wanna fly like this, like this is amazing. And by the time we landed, we had an idea for a company called Marquee Jet. Really just because we wanted to fly privately. And the concept was very simple, it was like, what if you could have all the benefits of owning your own plane? It's available anytime you want on short notice. You can go anywhere you go, want to go. And you, know, you, have, you have the benefits and luxury of you know, traveling without going through the commercial airports, but none of the responsibilities. What if we took away the maintenance, the servicing, the, the pilots, the scheduling? That would be like amazing. So that, that was the concept. Like this is an amazing idea. Like, it, 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 people are gonna want this. And what if we set it up like a debit card where you prepaid 100 grand, you fly 25 hours, you know, you fly two hours, you buy 25 hours of flight time for 100 grand. If you fly an hour, you have 24 hours left. Like the most basic, simple thing. We could definitely sell that. We loved it. The problem, we had no airplanes. It's pretty hard to start a private jet company with no airplanes. So we took a meeting with the 800 pound gorilla, NetJets. They own 850 planes, owned by Warren Buffett, the 800 pound gorilla. We take a meeting, we put together this amazing PowerPoint deck, and we sit down with the CEO, Rich Santulli and his team, and we start pitching our presentation, and 12 minutes into the presentation, he says, stop, he says, guys, the meeting's over. If you think, and this is a direct quote, 
pretty much. He said, if you think, this is what this guy said to me, if you think I'm giving two 29-year-old kids that probably didn't break 1,000 on their SAT, which pissed me off. I got like a 980 on my SAT, but I, <laughs> if you convince yourself enough and round up, it becomes like it gets to 1,000. If you think I'm giving two kids that didn't even break a 980 on their 1,000 on their SAT access to my 800 airplanes, he's like, that's never happening. The meeting's over. So we'd start walking out of the meeting, dejected, like this was our big, this was the big idea. And as we're walking out, the president comes running over, streamlines right to me. He goes, guys, that was unbelievable. Unbelievable. We got thrown out in 12 minutes. He said, nah, Rich Santulli doesn't give anybody 12 minutes. He said, there's something here. Come back and pitch this differently. So we realized we could never get across to them and sell them this vision on a PowerPoint because they see a thousand PowerPoints every week that they say yes or no to. We had to be a brownie. We had to do it completely differently. We had to stand out. We had one shot. We had to make it different. So we brought in our own focus group. We literally brought in a table, put it, set it up right here, and we brought in eight people. Carl Banks, who was on the New York Giants at the time, Run from Run DMC, a high-powered uh, real estate uh, gal, lady from New York City, uh, a Wall Street mogul. And one by one, they stood up. They were our presentation. And they said, we would never buy a fraction on an airplane, what NetJets was selling. It's too big a commitment, too much money. But if there was a simple program where we could buy 25 hours, each one of them pled their case and said they have 10 friends that would do it. And we walked out with a deal. A year later, we were bigger than NetJets. We did $5 billion in sales, and we sold the company to Warren Buffett slash NetJets. My first assignment at Marquee Jet was to build the, we had four employees, it was my partner and I and two guys. And we were like, man, we gotta build out, we have to build credibility. Because if we're gonna go sell this, and I'm gonna go to Roland, I'm gonna say, guys, Roland, I wanna sell you time on my airplane. He's gonna say, well, who flies with you? And if I say, oh, well, my, my father flies with me and my next door neighbor, he'd be like, what's that? But if I said, Oprah flies with us, Bill Clinton flies with us, he'd be like, okay, like they probably vetted it with their team. There's credibility, like the sale process would be streamlined, it'd be much easier. So like if we can build out the entertainment vertical and get some real big names, then everybody else will follow. And I was in charge of that vertical. So one day I'm, I'm in a cab, I lived in New York City, I only wore shorts until I was 35 years old. So I'm in shorts in literally January, I'm taking a cab to my office and I get a ding on my phone. My phone never dings. If I get a ding, it was an alert that we had a flight. We had like four customers, so if I, if I got a ding, it was like we won the Super Bowl, I'm like, someone's flying today? <laughs> Who's flying? And I look at my thing and I see that Jennifer Lopez is on a demo flight and she, uh, on one of our planes and Ben Affleck and Matt Damon are on the plane. I'm like, that's our entire entertainment vertical right there. I gotta close them. So I said to the cab driver, take me to LaGuardia. So I bypass my office, I go to LaGuardia, I'm in my shorts, I fly to LA. They're going to the Sundance Film Festival. I fly to LA and I sprint out to the private terminal to meet them. And then I see Jennifer Lopez. They get upgraded, scheduling just complimentary, just the luck of the draw, to a Boeing business jet. A Boeing business jet is like Air Force One. It's $55 million, it has a bedroom, it has a boardroom a board in it, a shower. I mean, it is like, it is a macked out airplane. They're, they walk on the plane. So I see Jennifer Lopez. I said, Jennifer, just want to introduce myself. I'm Jesse Itzler, one of the co-founders of the company, and just want to make sure you have a great flight. Got you this upgrade today, and I hope you guys, guys enjoy it. She looks at me. She says, you own this airplane? I'm 29 years old. And of course, the answer is Warren Buffett owns the airplane. I mean, he owns the fleet. And I looked at her in the eye, and I said, uh, Yes, I do. <laughs> and she says to me, how many of these airplanes do you have in the fleet? I said, well, ma'am, we have 850 airplanes in our fleet. And she goes, you own 850 of these airplanes? And I looked her dead in the eye and I said, yes, I do. <laughs> now, like, our conversation is getting weird and Ben's here or whatever. So listen. I'm just gonna, I'm actually going to Sundance too. 
I'm on my way to Sundance. I'm going to sit with the crew up front. If you guys need anything in flight, just let me know. So I go and I sit with the crew. We get the 41,000 feet. I come out. They're serving food. And I'm like, man, I got to close these guys. Like, this is it. This is my one shot. So I start talking to him. And Matt says to me, he says, look, you seem like a nice guy. He says, when we land at Sundance, if you're not busy, I'm like, not busy? I don't even have a hotel room. He goes, if you're not busy, why don't you come to our premiere tonight? We're having an intimate gathering for our Project Greenlight premiere. I'm like, OK, that sounds great. Thank you. Yeah, and intimate gathering sounds amazing. So when we land, I'm like stalling because I don't have a car. I don't have luggage. And like, I don't want to, you know, so I, I'm like tying my shoe. I'm like, I'll see you guys. I'm talking to the pilot. When they get out of vision, out of sight in their limo, I'm like, taxi? You get a ta no, I get a taxi. I go to a hotel, like the only hotel that has room, 30 miles. Sundance is packed during January. I go like 30 miles away. And then I get some clothing, and I go to the Project Greenlight thing. And well, Matt, you're wrong. It's not an intimate affair. There's 3,000 people trying to get into one single door. It's like backed up. I can't get anywhere near the door. I'm like, man, I'm done. I'm never going to see these guys again for the rest of my life. I'm like, this is crazy. So I go over to the guy who's got the clipboard at the door. And I said, hey, guys. I said, hey, um, I'm Jesse Itzler. I'm on Matt and Ben's uh, advanced scout team. They just sent me. They're going to be here in exactly 25 minutes. And they want me to make sure everything is perfect before they get here. <laughs> guy opens up the gate. <laughs> I walk right in. I go up to the VIP section. There's a table just like this, all these tables. And they have little name tags like this. I see like Clooney and Damon and all these guys at their table. And you guys remember Paulie Shore from MTV? <laughs> Paulie Shore has got a, a card on one of the tables. So I take Paulie Shore's card, <laughs> throw it away, and I write, it's like <laughs> the fucking. <laughs> now I got a table, I, a seat at the table. <laughs> So Matt and Ben come. I'm sitting next to him. We start chatting. And Matt's like, oh, you made it. I'm like, yeah, man, it's so easy. Thank you. This is no problem getting in. And then um, I start talking to him. I said, well, when are you guys going back to LA? He goes, we're going back on Sunday. I go, get the fuck, so am I. Why don't you guys fly with me? He goes, no. I go, yes, fly with me. And I leave, him, I leave the club, and I call my partner, and I'm like, I need an airplane. It's like an airplane. Like, we have no money. We have no customers. We have no advertising budget. I'm like, I need an airplane. I'm like, I'm going to get these guys, man. This is this. We get me an airplane. He's like, if you don't close these guys, man, like, you know, we're at, not out of business, but we're, we can't afford it. So we get on the airplane and we start chatting, tell them about the program. And by the time we land, sign them up. And that's how we started this company that ultimately did $5 billion in sales. And my journey at Marquee Jet, uh, I decided I wanted to raise money for charity. So I decided I wanted to be a brownie. Instead of just going and having a golf dinner, like all my friends were doing, or honoring one of my friends and telling them to go call all their friends to raise money. Like, what's that? I don't want to do that. So I decided I wanted to do something different. So I decided I was going to run 100 miles nonstop in 24 hours for charity. That was my version of being different. And I gave myself 90 days to train for it. And I did a lot of research during my training about hydration and nutrition. Like, what do you drink if you're going to run for 24 hours straight? And what do you eat? How many calories do you have to take in? And everything pointed me in the direction of coconut water. And I was the, guinea, the human guinea pig for coconut water. <coughs> I drank, you know, I trained on it, I drank on it. I finished the race in 22 hours and 30 minutes. It put me in a wheelchair for four days, but I finished it. Thank you, yes. <laughs> Raised a ton of money. And um, when I was done, I'm like, man, when people discover the benefits of coconut water, this is gonna be the next big thing in beverage. Like, what I just experienced was amazing. And I spent a year traveling, traveling the world trying to figure out how to import coconut water. I went to Brazil, to Jamaica, all over the globe. And then I realized that the guy at NetJets might be right. Like maybe I did get a 980 because I cannot figure this thing out at all. Like this is way over my capabilities. Like I couldn't figure out how to do it, but I knew I could market it. So I partnered with a company called Zico, Z-I-C-O, located actually right not far from here at all at the time. They were doing about $3 million in sales and partnered, brought Coca-Cola in as a partner. So it was a three-way partnership between my company to do the marketing, 
Zico to do the operations, and Coke to be a strategic investor with an option music, a dinner party with my wife, and the host of the party asked everyone to go around and name three people that were alive that they would want to have dinner with. And we got all the regulars, you know, Gates, Buffett, I mean, think about who you would want to have dinner with. Um, it's really interesting. There's not a ton of people probably that come to mind. And you had, you had Oprah and Gates and Zuckerberg, this guy. But when it came to me, honestly and truly, all three of mine were rappers. And the reason, the reason was, why, is because I wanted to meet the three guys that really changed my life as a kid growing up in New York. And I wanted to ask them questions individually about how they wrote their songs, how they did their marketing, what they're doing now. I wanted to thank them for giving me, you know, giving me, just putting me in a different direction. So after the dinner, I invited the 10 most influential artists in my life, I only knew two of them, to come to my house for dinner. And they all came. And people ask me all the time, like, well, oh, that's amazing. Like, how did you? I'm like, I called them and I asked them in a way that they would want to say yes. You know, it's like how you position stuff is so important. You know, I, just to take a little sidetrack for a second, I get so many emails. I'm sure you guys get a lot of emails too. It's amazing how no one knows how to write an email anymore. And like all the requests that come into me are super long winded. They have a terrible subject line. So like already they haven't grabbed my attention and they're not saying in a few words like what's in it for me and what's in it for them. Like when I write an email, if I'm going to ask you for something and I want you, you know, want something from you, I can spend 30 minutes on that email. Literally, how do I knock off two words? How do, is it punchy enough? Is it going to grab your attention? Delete. Let me do it again. Like, that's how important this shit is. You get like one shot. I'm getting emails. It's crazy. Well, when I called up these guys, I thought about what I was going to say, why they would want to get together. I was putting together a reunion. I wanted to host it. I made it very appealing and they all came. And what I learned from the meeting was that their career as musicians was very similar to mine as an entrepreneur. So like for one, these guys, these guys had no prior experience in the music business. Now for, neither did I. I had no experience in aviation or in beverage or in music or anything. And, and you know, for a lot of people, not having experience can be a big deterrent. It could be a dream crusher. Like you could say like, I always wanted to run a marathon or I always wanted to open a restaurant or I always wanted to have an apparel company. But I don't know, I've never done that before and I don't know anything about apparel. Where, where am I going to get the food for my, like, and you take these dreams and the fear of not having the experience talks you out of it in your own head. But for me, it was the best blessing because it guaranteed that everything I did, because no one taught me how to do it, would be different. It guaranteed I was a built-in brownie. And it guaranteed that I would have different results from everybody else. So I always say to people and my, and my, and my employees, if no one taught you how to do your job, how would you do it? Like if you didn't take a course, I was talking to my wife about this the other day. Like I said to her, like, Sarah, if you didn't go to college, would, would you still have Spanx? Like you never took a business class? Absolutely. Because she thinks she's not programmed. She has the freedom to be creative and come up with new ideas. So that to me was a big blessing. The second thing is, these guys were so young when they started out in the music business, they had no time to be scared. Now, I, I, I don't like to be embarrassed at all. I don't think anyone in here likes to be embarrassed. But when you get over the fear of being embarrassed, so you can pick up the phone and call the rappers or whatever it is you want to do, it's the most liberating gift. It's the most freeing thing you can do. Now, like I said, I don't like to be embarrassed, but I'm not scared of it. But it definitely wasn't like that for me, always. So when I was in college, I liked this girl. In fact, I was dating this girl for six months in my head. She didn't, <laughs> she didn't, we took one class together and she didn't even know I existed. I had a full-blown relationship with her in my own head. <laughs> and I decided I was going to invite her to my formal. But I was so scared to call her and ask her to come to my formal that I had to have my roommate call her up and say he was me. That's how scared I was of her saying no. Fast forward 20 years. I'm about to run that 100 mile race I just told you guys about. I like this girl named Sarah. She owns this company called Spanx. We're loosely friends, you know, we're friends, but I want to get on her radar in a bigger way. I'm about to run the race. So I call up her assistant and I say, Lisa, I said, I'm about to run this 100 mile race and I will run the entire 100 miles in Spanx 
which are women's pantyhose, by the way. <laughs> I'll run the whole race in Spanx if Sarah will give me a testimonial or a donation for my website. Now, I didn't really want to test, I mean, I did, but I really wanted Sarah. You know, she puts me on hold, she puts me on hold, and she goes, Sarah, um, some lunatic <laughs> is on the phone saying he's gonna go run 100 miles in Spanx. She says, I think I know that lunatic. <laughs> and a year later, she married the lunatic. <laughs> and had four lunatic kids with the lunatic. So what happened between this little, this kid that was so scared in college that he couldn't even hide behind a phone to call somebody up, to this guy 20 years later that's like, man, whatever it takes, whatever it takes, I don't care. This is what I want, where I wanna be. Well, in between those two extremes was a lot of self-doubt. It was a lot of talk in my own head and self-doubt is one of the greatest enemies to success. Not just business success, life success, both. So if we could eliminate the self-talk in our head, we'd all be more successful in all the areas of our life. Well, how do we do it? That's what I wanna to talk to you guys about today. So about five years ago, I'm at this race in San Diego. It was a, uh, it was a 24-hour race. It was a relay race. And here's the format of the race, okay? I was doing it with five friends. Here's the format. You run a mile, you run a mile, you run a mile, I run a mile. Whatever team runs the most amount of miles in 24 hours wins the race. Sitting next to me at the start of the race was a guy that had nobody to relay with. He was his own relay team. He was about 285 pounds, black guy, jacked up. And the race was self-supported. That means they provide nothing. It's on a dirt, unlit parking lot, one mile loop, and they don't even provide water. You have to bring everything yourself. I just sold my company to Warren Buffett. I went crazy on my supplies. I, over, I had a Whole, True, Whole Foods truck pull up. I had a tent company set up a tent. I had masseuses. I went fucking nuts. This guy over here, he's got three items. He's got one bottle of water, a box of crackers, and a fold-up chair. That's it for 24 hours. I'm thinking to myself, man, how in the world is a guy that weighs 285 pounds gonna run 2,400 miles plus on a crackers and water? And sure enough, at mile 70, 70 miles in, 70 miles in, he comes back to his chair and because of his weight, he literally broke every single bone in both of his feet. He crushed all the medicine. He ran his bones into the ground. And because he only had crackers and water and put his body under so much stress, he had kidney failure. And he was peeing blood right down his leg. And I'm like, man, we gotta get this guy, we gotta get this guy a medic. Immediately, like, airlift this guy out of the race to a hospital immediately. What does he do? He gets duct tape. He duct tapes his feet, he picks himself out of the chair, he runs 30 more miles to get to his goal of 100, and then he runs one more in case they miscounted. I gotta meet him, I gotta meet him, I gotta meet him, I gotta meet him because whatever secret sauce he has, whatever the drive is, whatever makes him tick that got him out of the chair to finish a race with not even an award, Whatever that secret sauce is, if I could learn that, man, if I could teach that to my kids, to my employees, if I could apply that to the areas of my life, every area of my life would be better. So I Google him, and I learned he's a Navy SEAL with an amazing backstory. Real quick, black guy, grew up in Brazil, Indiana, one of 10 black families out of 10,000, 20 miles from where the Ku Klux Klan was headquartered. So as a kid, he got beaten up, he got bullied, he got ridiculed, he loses his self-esteem, he blows up to be 300 pounds. No self-esteem. Joins the military, drops out. Becomes an exterminator. One day he's looking at himself in the mirror and he hates the reflection in the mirror. He hates what he has become, but more importantly, he's sick and tired of putting that responsibility, that blame on him, on everybody else. 
on the teachers for not intervening when he was getting beaten up, for his mom to move, for moving him to Brazil, to the kids that picked on him. And he's sick of it. He says, man, the only way that's going to change the direction of his life, of our life, is who? Fuck us. Him. So he re-enlists and goes and says he's going to become a Navy SEAL. So he goes down to the recruiter's office, and the recruiter says to him, Sir, you're going to turn 24 in 60 days. At 24, you age out of the SEAL program because you have prior military experience. So in 60 days, he loses 105 pounds. He breaks into the Y. He teaches himself at midnight how to swim, becomes a SEAL, loses six friends in a helicopter crash, decides he wants to be a brownie and raise money for the kids of the fallen soldiers, he Googles the 10 hardest things in the world to do, and he becomes the best endurance athlete on the planet. He breaks the Guinness Book of World Records for most pull-ups, does 4,030 pull-ups in 17 hours. I think we have a slide. Do we have a slide here? Do we have a slide? Oh, I got a slide. I got the slide thing? Here. He goes from this guy that I saw at the race to this guy. So I cold call him. I cold call him. Whoop, that's. I cold call him. I call him up. I say, I, want, I give him a quick pitch. He says, I'll see you tomorrow. I'll give you 15 minutes if you can be here tomorrow. So I, uh, I get on a plane. I fly to California. Now, I have no agenda. I just want to figure out, man, what makes this guy, what got him out of the chair? We start having our conversation. He's looking at his watch, and I realize I'm never going to get the secret sauce at a lunch meeting. And I ask him out of nowhere, I'm like, would you come live with me and my wife <laughs> for 30 days? I want to be clear about this. Would you come live with me and my wife for 30 days? He looks at me and he says, if you're crazy enough to ask a guy like me to come live with you, Motherfucker, I'm crazy enough to come. <laughs> Three days later, he's at my breakfast table. So my, my wife calls me up. She's like, how'd the lunch meeting go? I was like, the lunch meeting was unbelievable. He's coming live with us. <laughs> she's like, she's what? You met him on a bus? I'm like, no. He's coming to live with us Friday. Now, at this point in my life, I'm in a great place in my life. I was married, still am. I had one child. I now have four, but like probably everybody in this room, I would venture to say, I was in a routine. And my routine was this, get up, work out, go to work, full day at work, come home tired, eat dinner, play with my kids, put them to sleep, spend a little bit of time with my wife, watch some TV, tired, go to sleep, repeat. And routines can be good, but routines are a rut. Routines can also be a rut. I was doing the same thing every day, and I was operating, I thought, at a really high level, but I knew I could not possibly get better. You cannot get better doing the same thing every day. It's impossible. You can't get better doing the same thing. You have to mix it up. Even if you're up here, you want to go up here, you have to keep going, learning, trying, expanding. You think LeBron and Kobe stayed here? They kept working harder, doing different things, changing their diet experimenting. You can't get better doing the same thing. And, and I was in a rut. And I was so comfortable where I was that I couldn't even get out of it myself. I knew I needed help. So the deal he made with me was I had to do everything he said or he was leaving. That was our agreement. So Friday comes. He comes to my house. He's got a little Huck Finn knapsack like over his thing. <laughs> I'm thinking to myself, if I go to New York, in the middle of winter for 30 days, I'm checking like three suitcases, you know, under my delta. He's got this like little Huck Finn thing. I'm like, simplicity. I made a note of it. We'll come back to that in a second. He comes in. I call him Seal. In my book, I refer to him as Seal. I said, Seal. And I said, look, um, you know, thanks for coming, man. Make yourself at home. You know, my home is your home. He said, nah, I don't have a home. I said, no. No, make yourself at home is an expression. Make yourself at home is just an expression. And he walks over to me nose to nose and he goes, I don't operate in expressions. <laughs> it's going to be a really good 30 days. Like, <laughs> he says, in fact, I want to see how strong you are so we can map out 
the, uh, we can map out the month's program. So we go down to the gym and we go to the pull-up bar like Roland was saying. And we get down to the pull-up bar and he says, all right, let me see how many pull-ups you can do. I appreciate Roland saying I did 10. Um, that is an exaggeration. <laughs> I think I did eight and that might be an exaggeration too. It's like the SAT, I've told myself over and over that I did eight, I probably did like six. But I get up on the pull-up bar and I do like you know, eight, eight pull-ups and I drop down. He says, all right, wait 30 seconds and do it again. So I wait 30 seconds and I get up on the pull-up bar and I get maybe like five, maybe five, you know, barely. And I, I drop down and now I'm like, I'm hurting a little bit. He says, all right, wait 30 seconds, do it again. So I wait 30 seconds and I get back up on the bar. Now my arms, like the lactic acid's built up and I get one and I'm trying to get the second one. I'm kicking my legs and he's looking at me and, you know, 4,030 pull-ups. I'm trying to get my second one. I'm kicking fucking chin over this thing. <laughs> And I dropped down and, and I said, okay, well, you know, what's next? And he said, well, what's next is we're not leaving here until you do 100 more. I said, maybe in seal land that's possible. <laughs> but I said, honestly, sir, that, I, that's, I can't, that's impossible. I can't do 100 more. I couldn't do two. And he said, you know what, Jesse? I already know what your biggest problem is five minutes into our journey. What our biggest problem is. The limitations that we put on ourselves are self-imposed. The limitations that we put on ourselves, self-doubt, are self-imposed. And I'm going to prove it to you right now. Get up on the bar and do a pull-up. So I go back to the pull-up bar and I do a pull-up and I drop down and say, all right, well, I want you to wait. When you're ready, do another one. So I waited, you know, whatever, until I was ready and I did another one. So all right, go again. An hour and a half later, I completed the hundred. And I, as, I, as Roland said, I said to myself at that moment, if I'm under indexing by 100 pull-ups, like if I'm leaving 100 pull-ups on the table, what are the areas of my life am I under indexing in? What are the areas of my life am I saying to myself, are we saying to ourselves, like that's enough, I really can't go further than that. When we really have 100 times more, like if my sales quote at Marquee Jet is 20 jet cards, if I'm like, guys, put me down for 20 this month, I can sell 20. Am I saying that because I know I can get 20? Why am I putting that into the universe? Why aren't I saying to myself, man, put me down for 40? Let me challenge myself. I just put a business plan together for a new business that I had. I had my whole team come together and I showed my wife, I'm like, I feel really good about this. Like, I think that this thing can scale to a $20 million business, you know? And she was like, shame on you. She's like, why are you limiting yourself to $20 million? Why are you putting that out in the universe? She got me all fired up. I'm like, you're right. And I called my whole team together. And I'm like, whip up the plan. Show me a plan for $100 million. Show me how we get to $100 million. Rework the plan. Who's putting the limits on who in this room? So he had a rule called the 40% rule. And the 40% rule was this. When your brain says you're done, you still have 40% more. When your brain tells you you're done, you still have 40% more. Because it's a scientific fact. The way our brains are wired, the first time we experience pain or discomfort in anything, I'm not talking about physical, I couldn't even call the girl in college. Your brain is a defense me mechanism, taps you on the shoulder and says, stop. It doesn't want you to be humiliated or embarrassed. When you ignore the tap on the shoulder, and you tap into your reserve tank, could be sending extra emails, could be going on an appointment, could be looking at a property that you're like, oh, I'll do it next week, then someone beats you to it. When you ignore the tap on the shoulder and you access your reserve tank, then that is the difference, I'm telling you, between good and fucking great. That, it's that simple. We are all wired to do things we all are wired for, for comfort. We're all, we all try to avoid pain. It's those that break through it that are the difference makers. Because none of us are any better than any, any of us. None of us are geniuses. I did an IQ test here. There's no one here who's like off the charts. We're all in the same boat. When you ignore the tap on the shoulder and you tap into the 40%, that's the difference. Let me give you an example, just so you know, don't think this is hogwash. Every year in this country, 600,000 people, this is a fact, 600,000 people raise their hand and sign up and say, I'm going to run a marathon. They, they say, I'm going to run the greatest distance you can run, 26.2 miles. Other than an ultra marathon, the greatest distance you can run, 
They're going to try to do it. Of the 600,000 people that start at the starting line, what percent do you think actually finish? Anybody? Just percentages. 10, 60, good guess. 60 is a good guess. 5, 14. Right. Wrong. The answer is 98%. 98% of the people that start finish. And I will bet you guys, man, every single cent of stock that I own in the Hawks, that almost every single one of those runners, I've done dozens of them. Anyone run a marathon here? Okay, I'll, then you guys tell me if I'm right or wrong. Almost every single one of them experiences at some point what's called hitting the wall, right? You guys know the phrase or whatever. Hitting the wall happens around mile 18 to 22. At some point when your self-doubt kicks in, your defense mechanism kicks in, and your brain says, stop. Now, what the fuck are you doing? Your feet are swollen. You're tired. Your hips are swollen. You still got eight more miles to go. Stop. Why do 98% of the people finish? Because they ignore the tap on the shoulder. They're, they ignore it. They fight through the pain because their goal, your goal, has to be greater than the discomfort it takes to get there. If your goal is so important to you, if you're working on shit in your life right now, and that's like, it's bringing your life down, and you're like, oh, I'll do it later. It's just not important to you. If your goal is big enough, you tap into that 40% and you keep going, like the marathon runner. So he had a rule, he had an expression, every day we had to do something that sucked. We had to get comfortable being uncomfortable. And I didn't understand that at first. I'm like, I don't want to be uncomfortable. What are you talking about? And he put me through a series of unorthodox things that I didn't get at first. So one day we're sitting in Connecticut where I lived. I lived in New York and Connecticut, split my time. I'm watching TV and the emergency broadcast ticker comes through and it says that there's a, a stay inside, icy rain, low temperatures, freezing, you know, blizzard conditions, stay inside. It's coming across the screen. He's like, this is unbelievable. We got to go. I'm like, <laughs> they're telling us not to go. Like they're blasting this out. So we run 10 miles in a blizzard and we come home and I lived on a lake. The lake is frozen. Kids are playing hockey and he goes down to the lake and he wipes the snow off. He gets a boulder and he starts banging on the ice and he's banging on the ice and the ice cracks and he makes a little hole in the ice and he jumps in. <laughs> <laughs> and then he goes like this. <laughs> I'm not, going in, I'm not going in the water. I remember every day growing up in New York and Long Island, my mother would say to me, sweetie, don't go out in the winter. Don't go anywhere near this thin ice because if it breaks, you only have like 30 seconds and you can't get out of the ice. He's bathing in it. <laughs> he gives me one of these. I walk over to the ice. And I jump in and I can't breathe at all. It takes my breath away. I'm like, I finally get my breath and I'm like, I gotta get out right now. I gotta get out, man, I gotta get out. And he's like, you can't get out. I'm like, what do you mean I can't get out? He goes, if your skin touches the ice, it's gonna stick to the ice. Like the kid in Christmas story, his tongue. And he's like, and we won't be able to get you off it. I'm like, what, what am I supposed to do? He's like, put your hands in your shoes, put your socks on and bear crawl out. Don't let any of your skin touch the ice. So I get out put my shoes on, I'm bear crawling out. And then he looks at me, he's like, you got about four minutes, you're gonna get hypothermia, man. You've just been sweating. I'm like, hypothermia? <laughs> I don't want hypothermia, I don't know what it is. So I, I start like running up to my house. I live on an 80 yard hill and it's like, you know, three feet of snow and I'm flying up there. I'm all red, I'm freezing. And as I'm running up, I see my wife looking out the mirror, at the window. I would rather deal with the pissed off Navy SEAL than deal with my wife the way she's looking at me. And we come into the, we come into the house and she go, she's going nuts and she goes right up to the seal and she goes, gosh, we're seal. Now what's the medical benefit of jumping into a frozen lake? He said, there's no medical benefit. <laughs> it's a mental benefit. I wanna know how far your husband is willing to go to complete this to get to his goal. Because whatever he's willing to go here, is going to translate into all the areas of his life to finish everything that he wants to do it. And you can call it grit, you can call it resilience, you can call it mental toughness. I don't really know how you want to categorize it. It's not motivation. There's a big difference 
between motivation and resilience and grit and mindset, mental toughness, resiliency. Like if I said to everybody here, rolling everybody, we're all gonna run a half marathon, you know, we're all gonna do it, we're gonna do it in two weeks, everybody here. And we get, Roland brings Tony Robbins in and he gets us motivated and we play Rocky the movie and everyone's fucking going nuts. We put our hands in at the end, I'm like, all right guys, we're all gonna do it, everyone's gonna do it. And we break and everyone's hugging each other, we are motivated. I say, all right guys, we're gonna start tomorrow at, at, at 5 a.m. 0500, we're gonna meet in the, in the lobby at 5 a.m. Well, you go out tonight, have a couple of drinks, 5 a.m. comes, it's dark. I was up at 5 a.m. It's cold here at 5 a.m. It's windy. Like, the motivation goes away fast. It's how bad do you want it? It's the resilience. It's the consistency that gets you out of the chair, that gets you up tomorrow and the next day and the next day, and the next day. That's the difference. Now, obviously, everybody here is not gonna hire a Navy SEAL to come live with them, but you don't have to. There's a famous quote that I love. How you do anything is how you do everything. It's the little things in your life. You have to reset your brain to create a system, to create an environment in your brain that when things get hard or uncomfortable on any level, no matter what it is, that you don't stop, you keep going, that your goal's not done. 95% of the people, no, yeah, 95%, most people do 95% of the stuff the same. It's that extra 5%. You don't wanna go the 95, arrow. Instead of just going and wrapping it around the stupid thing to clean it up, that's an indication of what I'm becoming. Lazy, I'll do it tomorrow. Maybe someone else will do it for me. It's okay to not finish it 100%. It's not just a hose. It's how you do the little things in your life consistently creating a pattern of a mentality that you won't quit. They just asked Richard Branson in an interview. I thought this was really interesting. What the number one thing was for, around his success. You know what his answer was? Working out. If you ask me what was my thing, I would say running. I, I, this, I had that in my head way before I heard this interview. Because every single day, for 10 years, for 25 years, I've ran 9,000 days, 36,000 miles, 9,500 days, pretty much every single day alone. Whether it was raining, whether it was snowing, when I didn't want to go, when I was sick, that consistency in my life was everything. It translated into everything. There's also alone time, which allowed me to think, which is a whole, whole other thing, but that, that's the number one thing. It wasn't class that I took in American. It wasn't the brownie story. It was that little lesson. How you do anything is how you do everything. So did it work for me? So when he came to the house, I could do 22 push-ups. 22. When he left, I was doing 1,000 a day. Self-imposed limitations. He didn't make me stronger. I just realized that I had more in me. I was under indexing. He knocked one minute off of my pace per mile as a runner. That's, I mean, that's like seconds are, are impressive. A minute is unheard of, but he didn't do it. I just realized that I didn't want to go into an area where I was uncomfortable. I didn't want to push myself hard enough. Self-imposed limitations. And even just stuff with my kids. When I was like, when I would be like, you know, my son would be, crying or I'd be, I would all get impatient or unfocused or whatever, I'd be like, Jesse, you jumped into a frozen lake. You jumped into a frozen lake. Are you gonna let a, let a two-year-old that's crying get under your skin? No way. So it just translated into all of the buckets of my life. So I wrote a book about it called Living with a Seal. I, if you get it, great. If you don't, that's fine too. I just wanna give you guys a couple of the highlights that aren't uh, uh, and takeaways and then we'll open it up for a couple of questions if we have time. So um, <clears throat> the first thing is, when he, came into, when he came into my life, I wrote, I wrote a contract with myself. I wrote a contract with myself. And my contract with myself were like kind of my non-negotiables, because this was a guy with a military background. He had all these like non-negotiables in his life. And I was like, that's really cool, man. Like, this guy won't break his principles for anything. Like, I want to live. We can all use a little bit of that in our lives. So I wrote a contract with myself. And my contract with myself is very simple. It's like, it's along the lines of like, I'm not super 
religious or spiritual, but I wake up and I thank God that I'm alive. I have this opportunity. I'm going to be the best father I can be. I'm going to be good to my wife. I'm going to be present. All those kind of things. But the last thing on the contract with myself are these two words. Remember tomorrow. Remember tomorrow. Remember tomorrow happens is, uh, uh, is like my guiding, it's not my mantra, but it's like my guiding philosophy. And rem remember tomorrow means this. When you have to make a split second decision, remember how you're going to feel tomorrow as the result of that decision. So like you want to drop out, you want to drop out of the race at mile 18, that's totally cool. Remember tomorrow. You want to dance on the holiday table and drink tequila and have an amazing time and take your shirt off and swing it in the audience and be the star of the party? Amazing. Until tomorrow. Remember tomorrow. When you guys got to make decisions about what you want to do, like I'm just going to do the hose, I'm going to do my emails, I'm not going to sell the real estate thing, man, I'm gonna just, I'll do it next week. Remember tomorrow. The second thing is when he came into my life, people were like, oh, well, I don't have time to do that restaurant or that clothing company or whatever it is that we talked about. Like, I always wanted to do it, but I don't have the time for that. So I, I hate time as an excuse. And that's our number one excuse that most people do. So here's what I did. I drew a very simple pie chart, an exercise that changed my life. I drew a very simple pie chart, 24 hours in a day. The one thing that we all have in common, we're all given the same 24 hours in a day. Okay, we all have the same amount of time to accomplish our goals. 24 hours in a day, I sleep seven of them. You might sleep six, eight, I need seven, that's my number. Seven hours in a day. I take three hours a day for me. Now before you say you don't have three hours for yourself, let's finish the exercise. That three hours is cumulative. Okay, I call it the three hour rule. The three hour rule. That exercise is cumulative, so I might go for a walk, it's an hour, I might sit in my room and do nothing. I might watch TV, read magazines, but when I'm in my time, I'm not guilty that I'm not with my kids or my wife or at the office. And when I'm at the office, I'm not guilty that I'm not with my kids or, or whatever. That's where I'm supposed to be, okay? Because I don't wanna go through my life resenting my wife or my boss or my partner or anybody for taking away the one thing that I had that's important to me, the things that I like to do, my time. Like if they told me I couldn't run, I'd be pissed at rolling. I'd be pissed if you, know, you can't take away the things you like to do. If you don't have that and control, and control of the things you want to do in your own time, you, you have to take a real good look at how you're living your life, in my opinion. Seven for sleep, three for me. The average American works 40 hour a week. That's eight hours a day. Well, guess what? You still have six hours left in the day. Now, and you took three for, now, of course, you have to commute, you have to eat, you have family. I get all that. But my point is, when you start at our age, no one here is a teenager anymore, all right? When you start eliminating the things that aren't going to get you whatever, wherever you want to go, when you take out that fluff out of your life, the day is a long day. Now, I learned that running 100 miles. If you keep going, you can do it. You just got to keep going. You can't stop and watch the Kardashians, okay? The average American lives to be 78. That's uh, 27,480 days or something. I'm 50. I'm about to be 50. It means I got like, I got, I got 28 summers left, man, if I'm average. I love summer. Like, you don't have time to waste goes back to my aggravation versus reward. And the third thing is, when the rappers came to my house, that was a bucket list item. I love bucket list stuff, but I'm a bigger believer in dropping the B and adding an F and creating a bucket list. Because <laughs> those are the things you always wanted to do, but maybe you were embarrassed to do it. Maybe you were scared to do it. Maybe you didn't have the time to do it. But those are the things that require preparation, training, maybe failure, but those are the things that will make you feel most alive. Those are the things that will make you feel most alive. So I have a quote. I'll leave you guys with this. I have a quote that I look on every day in my room. I think about it every day. It's one of the first things I look at when I wake up. It's a constant reminder. And that is, I didn't come this far to only come this far. We didn't come this far to only come this far. No one would be in this room if this is as far as you wanted to go in your life. So figure out, do it with urgency, what it is you want to do, 
consistently. Thank you guys. Woo.